Okay. So welcome to another Open 2020 webinar. Um, we're very pleased to have Diana Finch here from the Bristol Pound, who's going to tell us about what's been happening there and plans for the future. So straight over to you, Diana. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen and go through a few slides to start off with. Um, bear with me one moment. Okay, can everyone see a slide now? Yes. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to run through initially what it was Bristol Pound was trying to do. Um, then I'll run through some of the learnings from that and, and then we'll move on to uh, as a result of those learnings, what are we going to, to do going forward? And maybe suggest that everyone mutes themselves at this point, um, just to save on feedback and, and stuff, uh, and, uh, and unnecessary background noise. And then um, when I've run through these slides, Ollie's going to step back in to ask a few sensible questions and chair a bit of a discussion. Uh, so what, what was it that Bristol Pound was trying to do when it set itself up? Um, and it came really out of the uh, transition Bristol um, movement, which was very much around localization, of course, um, a, a feeling that, uh, yeah, I think it was in 2003 that, that the pie chart of oil um, use showed that more was being spent on or used uh, in transporting stuff around than in just producing the stuff in the first place. So I think that was one of the major drives, you know, we've got to localize got to cut CO2 um, for transport. And then came the financial crash. And at that point, uh, and you know, by this stage as well, I think Lewis and Totnes had already started up their town pound schemes. And uh, the transition group in Bristol started to think, you know, we're, maybe we should be doing this as well, because it's not just about reducing carbon dioxide from transport. There's also something bigger here about um, insulating the city from those global economic trends. Uh, we had seen, you know, perhaps in places like Swindon and um, and also uh, South Wales, you know, not not far from where we are, uh, that actually um, where where a city is too focused on particular industries and particular large corporates, that things like a financial crash can have a devastating effect. So there's a feeling that it would be stronger, we would be a stronger economy if it was much more focused on small independent businesses uh, in a, you know, covering a wide variety of sectors. And there was a feeling that uh, in order to enable that, uh, we needed to encourage people to choose to shop in those local independent businesses and as well to encourage those independent businesses to, to form supply chains with each other to keep that money kind of circulating uh, amongst Bristol's independent uh, businesses. Uh, that tracked economy would meanwhile in enable what's called the lo local multiplier effect, which is a theory that you, know, you track some money in this closed system and it's gonna go round and round much faster than, than sterling, um, much of which leaks out of the local economy straight away when spent in, in bigger uh, shops and with bigger businesses. Um, and so we do also be keeping that money local uh, and those businesses with their local shareholders would then um, be reinvesting in the city and creating long-term jobs for the city. You know, the problem with inward investment as a mechanism for growth is that three years down the line, PricewaterhouseCooper decides that actually it's blah, blah, arm is gonna move from Bristol to Manchester and those, those jobs are just lost. What it wasn't about is increasing liquidity or improving access to credit. You know, this wasn't a kind of typical, oh, we're in a recession, let's try and improve access to money. Um, it, was, it was about changing, um, tilting the economy rather than enabling more economy. And so the idea was that there would be these individual members, they would change money into uh, Bristol pounds. And, and I should say that Bristol pounds are just sterling with some extra rules and pretty pictures. You know, they're not, they're not what many people would call an alternative currency in that it's, it's basically just sterling, but with extra rules to make it function differently. So once you've turned your money into Bristol pounds, 
uh, it then can only be spent with those business members. I mean, it can also be extracted from the system. It's, it's worth saying that. Um, but you know, the, the ideal theory was that this money would just circulate in the closed loop. A little bit might go back into individual people's pockets through uh, part payment of wages and things. And um, you know, the, the main forms of the money were paper and initially through uh, text to pay or MS messaging and uh, later on through an app. Um, but you know, there's always that digital and paper right from the word go. And broadly, you would say it's been quite successful. Uh, since its launch in 2012, it grew very quickly to be the largest UK local currency scheme with paper and digital money. Uh, I think it was only the second uh, after Brixton to have that digital money scheme and able to pay local taxes in, in the local currency, which is again a first and I think was only possible because it was a sterling backed currency. Um, membership grew to you know, fa fairly quickly to about 1500 individual members. That's carried on growing. In fact, it's probably 1620, I think last time I checked. Uh, and businesses have sort of upped and down a bit. I think it's currently about 508 or something or 550, I don't know. Um, and in terms of scale, we're talking about a million pounds per year circulating through the system, of which about 10% is paper money. But all of these stats are, well, not, not so much the membership, but the usage stats are dropping off. Um, we're, we're seeing drops of about 20% year on year since 2016. So I was brought in in 2018 to kind of look at this and go, what's gone wrong? How can we revive the Bristol Pound and, and make it achieve the things that we always wanted it to achieve. Because you know, despite these kinds of numbers and saying we're the biggest and we're the best, um, the actual impact on the local economy when you're talking a million pounds per annum in city, in, in you know, Bristol's total economy, it, it's a tiny drip in the ocean. It's not enough to make any real measurable uh, significant change. So we learned some stuff from this, you know, when we started to look at what's gone wrong, um, the first thing that, that I think I picked up was that the marketing and tone of voice, whilst it was understandable that that's how we started it, we should have, we should have changed how we sold ourselves very quickly. The problem was that we had a very um, sort of strident, rah, 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 you must shop local, oh, don't go to Tesco, Tesco is very evil, you know, it was very binary. Um, we sounded quite judgmental. Uh, which isn't a great way to make friends and influence people. Uh, it sounded really exciting and interesting to people who already cycled everywhere, already shopped local, already thought very deeply about you know every, everything to do with the economy. Uh, but it didn't play so well with, well, I'm a typical, typical mother of three. I've got a limited amount of time, a very limited budget. You know, am I really going to go to the, you know, the, the grocers and the butchers and the candlestick makers and do all my shopping individually and pay over the odds? You know, no, I'm not. Uh, and to suggest otherwise was you know, magical thinking. Um, and, uh, and it also started to count against us because with that kind of anti big business message, that didn't play well with the new Labour administration when it came in. And actually, it, it didn't work well in terms of trying to change the economy. You know, if I'm going to try and really give a boost to small independent businesses, well, I should be making good friends with those big businesses because their procurement and supply chains actually hold a great deal of power. Uh, but of course, they didn't particularly want to talk to us because we were saying, oh, you're nasty big businesses, you know, again, it's a not a great way to make friends and influence people. The next problem was I realized that the, the business model was really flawed. I mean, these days, if you're starting a, a business from scratch, probably the first thing you'll do is download the business model canvas uh, you know, from the internet. And that'll take you through a process of identifying your customer segments. Okay, small businesses, what do small businesses want? They want help with marketing and networking. Okay, here's a value proposition for them. Or individuals, what do they want? Well, they quite like nectar points and special loyalty schemes. So, so we'll devise something for them here. But we just didn't bother with any of that. We said, no, 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 we, we don't need to think about what you're gonna get and what you're gonna get. We're not fixing your individual problems. We're fixing this thing up here. 
uh, and I'm, I'm, this is out of you know, out of shot of my screen on purpose. You know, it's like no, no one, no one can see this stuff. No one really cares about it. Certainly, for your average punter, you know, when they say, "So, what are you giving me?" Oh, we're doing this lovely stuff up here. Um, it, it just doesn't really make sense to them. So I think that yeah, there was that flawed business model, and quite apart from the um, um, uh, money in, money out bit if you like of the of the business model which um i mean it was it was always going to be tricky to say oh we're operating this payment platform it's very niche it's only for this certain sort of business and for some very woke individuals um you're operating at that kind of scale to cover costs you know infrastructure of the platform plus uh, you know, the office rent and my exorbitant salary, you know, clearly this was going to be very difficult uh, to, to make it work. And of course, in the time since 2012, um, you know, the payments market has changed significantly. Whereas back in 2012, perhaps uh, um, merchants on the high street were paying, I don't know, 2.5, 3% even on their card transactions. You know, now we're down at 1% or well below even. Um, depending a bit on whether you're having to pay for a terminal or not. Um, so yes, so that they, we've always been grant reliant and that, that's not a long-term solution. And the third area was really, you know, the digital platform itself. Um, we had decided to go with Cyclos because that's great for member-to-member -member payments and it was designed really for mutual credit and businesses. It wasn't designed for real money with consumers and businesses. And as soon as we wanted to use Cyclos in that way, we were coming up against regulatory concerns. And so we needed a regulated back end. So we had this complex thing with Cyclos up here doing the member to member payments and Cyclos being the kind of uh, regulated entity where money comes in and money goes out uh, and they needed to be kept um, you know, in sync. So there's an overnight batch update process to keep all of that happening together. Uh, oh, and I've left out some of it. There's the, you know, the trader directory over here and the app and the app in, you know, interfaces with the trader directory and interfaces with Cyclos. And, you know, it, it's just, I mean, if you try and draw uh, the architecture out, uh, you know, it, it just looks, well, it looks very poor, frankly. Um, and as well, because we'd had to get the credit union involved as our regulated back end, they owned all of the data. So where I was thinking, well, that's okay, I can turn Bristol Pound around. Uh, I will look at all of the people, all of the businesses that are not spending their Bristol Pounds. I'll pick up the phone, I'll give them a ring, I'll say, hey, who do you need to talk to? And I'll free up these supply chains and get the money moving. But because BCU owned all the transaction data, I actually wasn't allowed to do that. I, I don't know which businesses are spending money and which, which businesses are hoarding the Bristol Pound. So it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to inter intervene proactively to make things work better. I can't even say, rah, 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 here's our Bristol Pound, uh, fabulous business member of the month, uh, because I'm not allowed to, to see who that is. So very difficult to promote it, very difficult to help businesses even make a name for themselves by engaging with this fabulous um, you know, ethical world. But worse than all of that, I think there were two big things that really we hadn't foreseen at all uh, in the early days. Um, we were basically saying, we want you businesses to change your supply chains, but we didn't quite say that to them and we didn't make it very easy for them to do it. We just had this quite naive thought that they would look at their Bristol pound balance and go, oh, look at all that lovely money in Bristol pounds. Where could we spend it? Oh, let's look in the directory. You know, it's a very sort of, it's like, well, that's not how businesses decide to spend money. You know, that they've got trusted suppliers in place. They don't muck about with that uh, lightly. You know, oh, let's try a new cocoa supplier. Oh, well, actually now our brownies don't taste good and no one's buying them. You know, it's a big risk to, to start to mess about with your supply chain. Um, and especially if you're you know, under time limitations, like, oh, I've run out of toner right now and I've got to get my invoices out today uh, or my boss is going to be very angry. Uh, I, I'm not going to waste a lot of time uh, asking the bookkeeper if there's any money in the Bristol Pound account and then going through a directory and ringing up some absolute strangers. I'm just going to get on the phone to Bob, 
because he's a sweetie and he always drops my tone around when I forget to order it in advance. And then even if businesses did change their supply chains, and some did, you know, I'm not saying none of them did, um, I'm just saying it's the minority that, that really took that seriously. But the bookkeeping is a nightmare. Um, so what we're basically saying is to our bookkeepers, who are you know, often with small businesses, they're remote book bookkeepers, they're not terribly engaged in the day-to-day -day business. And we're saying, look, what we want you to do is every supplier invoice that comes in now that we've joined Bristol Pound, please can you check and see if they're a Bristol Pound member? And if they are, please can you find a way of flagging that up on QuickBooks or Xero or whatever? Uh, and then you'll need to find some way of filtering the, the accounts payable report so that we can have, these are the people you got to pay with Bristol Pounds, these are the people you got to pay with normal money. And then the normal ones you can just go ahead and do as normal in your lovely simple way where you highlight them, it makes a CSV file, it goes off the bank, no rekeying, no errors, nice and easy. Uh, and then these other ones, these Bristol Pound ones, please can you log on to the Cyclos system, key in each individual transaction, uh, and of course there might be a few mistakes in there. Oh, and then if you get to the end and there's not quite enough money, you might need to part pay an invoice over here and then pay the rest in sterling. And then please can you work out how to do that part payment thing properly on QuickBooks so that we can do the bank reconciliations and they all, uh, do you know, what? It's, it's an absolute nightmare. And unless you're a, a pretty, you know, pretty hot bookkeeper. Um, anyway, there I was, new in my job, and I'm thinking, okay, these are the things I've got to fix. I've got to create a sustainable business model. I've got to scale up. Uh, we've got to deliver more impact. Uh, we've got to get a new platform. But partway through this um, process of thinking about how to save the Bristol Pound, um, about this time last year, I found myself thinking, why would I do this? What I, why would I try and save the Bristol Pound when I've just proved to myself that it is an extremely difficult model to make work? It's very unlikely ever to work, uh, you know, to get the, the volume of transactions where it could stand a chance of, of making money uh, and where we could you know, really get the businesses to, to uh, change their, their behavior in their supply chains and do all the extra bookkeeping and training of staff. And, you know, why would I try and do this? Why don't I accept that we are in a completely new world uh, and that if we're going to play in the field of payments, actually our, our competitors are the likes of Google Pay, Apple Pay, PayPal, um, and if, we, if we're going to make something in the payments field um, that can wash its face, you know, be a viable, um, a viable, what do you call it, business, um, then we need to be operating at significant scale. We need to be capturing 50%, 80% of the transactions in Bristol. And then we can say, hey, you know, we're a non-profit platform uh, and so if we do make any surpluses we'll reinvest them in, in local good causes we suddenly have a, a real differentiator with the google pay and apple pay where everyone knows we're just making a, you know, a few rich guys in california even richer and so that's that's really the plan let's start off with um, a payment platform that operates at scale uh, and is a direct com com in direct competition, if you like, with this kind of old model where you know, I go to a shop, I put my device or my card on a point of sale thing, the, the shop gets most of the money, some of the money drifts off to these other organisations. Um, and what we're doing is, is saying it'll be something quite similar. It'll be better because it's an e-wallet solution. So as soon as the money leaves my account, it is in the business account. You know, it's simultaneous. It's not actually going via a merchant acquire and clearing bank and blah, blah, blah. And three days later, the small business gets the money and then has to do a reconciliation, uh, which is how it is, you know, in this top, uh, you know, the, the top scenario. Uh, no, instead, you know, this is a true e-wallet solution. And yes, there still needs to be some kind of transaction charge because, uh, you know, I still have to pay for the platform and, uh, and pay, you know, salaries and, and the rent. Uh, but I can make sure that, that you know, when we're operating at scale, uh, and in fact, we're going to say this from day one, we're going to start a, a totalizer from day one, in, in effect, putting off the, um, the point at which there's a true return on investment. But um, given that I think that is the strongest story that we have to tell, um, we'll be saying we're raising money for good causes right from day one. Um, 
and I mean this is the Bristol City Funds uh, logo, it wouldn't necessarily go to Bristol City Funds, it might go to the Community Quartet Foundation. Ideally, I want at some point for this to be a community benefit society and you know we pass that over to the members, you know, where should our surpluses be spent? Um, but it's not really, so I mean, that's what we'll be doing, running a payment platform, but that's pretty boring. You know, just raising a bit of money for charity is pretty boring. It's not really challenging the status quo. Uh, and Bristol Pound continues to want to play in a very different sport than market economics. You know, mainstream economics is all about competition and winning and getting rich. It assumes everyone's going to behave very rationally with their own self-interest at heart. It's addicted to growth. And we assume the market will just solve all of these supply and demand problems and create a perfect economy. Uh, and we know that that has really failed. So we need to be looking at different approaches to economics, which are based on collaboration and setting fair rules, which understand how people work. People work you know, with heuristics, with rule of thumb, uh, and, and then therefore they're not very rational. In fact, that, you know, that's why we've allowed climate change to get where it's got to. Without, um, you know, without seeing it coming, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's crept up on us because we aren't good at those long-term rational decisions. We need to think about uh, purpose of institutions over and above shareholder return, and we need to think about the power structure institutions, which are really shaping and modelling things, uh, rather than just allowing the market to shape and model everything. So. Uh, given that we're trying to develop a different kind of economy, that means we need something other than just money. You know, money has really been developed to enable that market economy. Um, and I guess you could say that, that uh, money has got three main functions, um, a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. And actually some exciting things could happen if we started to separate those out. So instead of saying uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's all of these things together, we might be able to develop tokens that are a, a medium of exchange, but not a unit of account. So we might have a token which is not associated with any kind of, uh, you know, sterling equivalent value, but we just swap them around and acknowledge, hey, you did a nice thing, thank you. Oh, half a dozen eggs from your chickens, great, here's a token. Uh, you know, you cut my hair, great, here's a token. Um, you've lent me your power drill, great, uh, here's a token. And we can start to develop, uh, you know, a sharing economy and a gift economy uh, through those kinds of token exchanges. Uh, and then what about if it was the store of value? but not a medium of exchange. And this is where we get into things like um, uh, reputation currencies. You know, um, they're things like, uh, you know, your Uber rating, if you like, or, you know, I've got 10 O levels. I can't give them away to anybody, but they enable me to do stuff. So uh, actually we can think of tokens sometimes as a badge to show an engagement level or a trust level. And that could be very interesting to play with. And then we could have a unit of accounts, but that isn't a store of value and isn't a, a, a medium of exchange. Uh, so we can, example, we can think, for example, of what if we had some tokens uh, to help people manage their carbon footprint, um, where you were saying to people, look, here's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a daily um, allowance, if you like. And if people chose to, to interact with that, they could quickly see uh, and modify their behaviour to try and to try and bring it in line with, um, you know, with something much more sustainable. So, I mean, thinking about these tokens, then let, let's let's have a few for examples. And these for examples, I'm not saying are necessarily you know, the right ones. They're just some possible ones. I and mean, I think that the potential uses are limitless. I mean, everything from encouraging kids to do after school football to you know getting people to run around the park to keep fit i mean there's just it's just limitless when you start to think about what could we be trying to influence these but here's a starter for 10. so the council might say yeah we'd like to engage with the tokens because we want to implement our one city plan so bristol has this thing called a one city plan it was developed with a range of stakeholders and people all across the city so it's not a it's not a bristol city 
council owned document if you like it's been it's been developed in partnership and it's got great aspirations you know by 2050 bristol frankly is going to be utopia on earth you know if, if they succeed in in really putting the plan into place um but they have a problem you know so let's say one of them is uh, you know we want to be carbon neutral by 2030 great idea and marvin reese our mayor is out there you know laying loads of bicycle tracks and uh, and making sure that all of our buses are gas powered and as eco-friendly as they can possibly be but actually if people still jump in their cars it's all pointless so we need some things to encourage behavior change to really make the most of the other sorts of investments that the council will be doing to try and bring the, the plan into effect so they might say yes we really want uh, to encourage people to change their behavior so we're going to reward you with tokens for taking your own coffee cup and water bottle and reusable lunch container for using self-propelled transport instead of jumping in your car or if you do have to jump in your car by staggering your journeys so that you're not adding to the pollution problems at particular times of day uh, if you check on your neighbor that might be helping our adult social care team uh, you can be making sure they you know their heating is working they've got a pint of milk for the morning and all of their drugs and they're basically you know fine when you say good night to them um and uh and so people earn tokens for doing great stuff meanwhile um the, the council would also like businesses to be doing some great stuff so businesses ideally would be embracing a you know green agenda and thinking about their own um performance this is especially relevant when you consider that um i saw a stat recently they reckon that between uh that 70, 60 to 70 percent of all industrial pollutants are created by SMEs, and you know often the big, the big bad companies, if you like, they're doing a lot, spending a lot of money on their CSR and you know backfilling the SDGs into their you know corporate strategies and all the rest of it, and paying carbon measurement consultants you know, lots of money to try you know, but little businesses have no idea where to start on this stuff and they don't have money to throw it so yeah, lovely scheme for businesses to get involved and get greener and they say if you, you know, the council says if you sign up to this scheme guess what we'll we'll let you part pay your business rates and tokens in effect giving you a discount on your business rates and so then these businesses want tokens and they say hey local people who've been doing lovely things and earning tokens come to our shops get a bit of a discount uh, and uh, and that's great. So with one circulation of a token, we've got a person doing something which helps implement the one city plan. We've got uh, you know driving footfall to the high street uh, and to local shops and business, which is also part of the one city plan. And we've got businesses improving their environmental performance again in line with the one city plan. So you know what's not to like? There is a bit of a loss in earnings potentially for the council, but. Um, uh this is basically an implementation cost for delivering the one city plan which they need to do because otherwise they won't be in power very much longer and then the other thing is this kind of the more normal community currency stuff if you like um which i've kind of already gone through and i suspect for this audience uh, i don't need to spend any more time on this slide at all i can come back to it if there are questions uh, and then this is going back to that thing of you know, tokens as a store of value. Um, you know, we can imagine that, and the reason this is important actually, is that what we don't want to do with tokens is buy people off. You know, we don't want to, to, to buy behaviors. We don't want to um, make people change their intrinsic motivation or undermine their intrinsic motivation for doing something good like um, cycling to work to, to save on um, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, if we give too high a, um, a token in terms of what it can get you, you know, the, the, especially if it's exchangeable for goods and services, there is a slight danger that we undermine their intrinsic motivation for, do it, for doing that, uh, replace it with an extrinsic motivation and then guess what if the money runs out or we choose a different reward that, that this you know that this person x doesn't like well they'll just go back to jumping in the car because actually they always preferred it we haven't done anything to develop their intrinsic motivation so it's very important that we do some fairly detailed research we're, we're trying to work with university of west of england to come up with some pilot projects around this 
to make sure that we are looking at intrinsic extrinsic motivation see where people are currently see what kind of motivator would help people to change their behavior but without um, without uh, creating the wrong reasons for them to do that the other thing is that it's not just money that's leaking out to the likes of Google and Apple it's it's data and that data is then used to drive more personalized advertising, which means more sales, which means more scope three emissions. You know, it's just fueling the consumer driven economy. But we could be doing something quite different. We could be pooling all this data from both payments and tokens and using it at, at an anonymized level in a holistic way uh, to really understand what's going on in the economy and start to plan much better, you know, start to create better policy. Uh, to, to help meet the challenges of the future. The good thing about this, and it, we'd always wanted, you know, for Bristol Pound to be a, oh yes, we'll have Bristol Pay, we'll have uh, Bristol Pound, or top list pound, you know, we'll have a whole load of town pounds everywhere and we'll change the world. But actually, because it was such a clunky, you know, I've described this Cyclos BCU, you know, that wasn't the kind of thing that you could just easily replicate everywhere because everyone's credit union operates slightly differently to everyone else's credit union. So that was never going to be a way forward. But now with an e-wallet solution, which is a standalone platform, you know, we can start to proliferate. You know, once we've worked it out in Bristol, we really can have extra pay, Manchester pay, Bath pay, and, you know, we'll probably... Uh, have an overall brand, which would be CityPay. By the way, th this is uh, new branding. I got these branding guidelines through, we've been doing a process for you know, two or three weeks on this, uh, and this is what we're going to be launching with. Um, and this is just a little schematic showing that underlying structure uh, of you know, CityPay, an entity which will be a peer-to-peer -peer platform and be regulated in its own right, with all of that sterling stuff which is where we're you know, challenging the Google Pay and the Apple Pay and how we're paying the bills and potentially raising a bit of money for good causes. You know, that, that's one side of it. And then the token schemes are part of that, but they're not particularly backed by anything. Well, they, they may be backed, if you like, by real tokens on a blockchain, um, but, but not by, backed by anything physical. Um, and then in each of the implementations, you know, there'll be a series of e-wallets, uh, they'll be able to be accessed by both cards and by, by phone, maybe not all at once. Um, I suspect phone apps will come first and cards will come later. And the important thing on this slide really is that each of these uh, local entities will be its own legal entity where you know, decisions are being taken about what tokens do we want here in Bristol or in Manchester or wherever it is, uh, what do the people want? So, you know, I, I see these as hopefully being in, in, in due course, community benefit societies that can have, and the reason I'm saying community benefit society rather than a co-op is so that we've got that asset lock that we can use so that any money that is raised for good causes, you know, that the, the members can then decide uh, where that money should go. Uh, and and it's, you know, it's just, very scrupulous, if you like. You know, this is a, a non-profit structure. Um, so I think that's basically it for the slides. Yes, um, I, I may come back to them if you know if people have questions, or I may have other slides that I haven't shown you today. But it, it's so, Ollie. Uh, back to you now. Sorry, I, I did drone on for a bit longer than I was supposed to. No, not at all, Diana. That was brilliant really informative it makes me yeah i've got a bunch of questions and other people probably have too um but so just quickly i just wanted to go back and um make sure we fully understood so previously the only way to get a bristol pound was to buy one with a great british pound yeah and then what happened to those great british pounds while the bristol pounds were circulating um, so they sit, the paper ones sit in a trust account so that uh, one of the jobs I have to do every month, which is a lot of fun, is look at the most horrible spreadsheet you've ever seen in your entire life. Try and work out how many uh, pounds are currently in people's back pockets, Bristol pounds, and then make sure that that's the amount of money in the trust account. Um, we did get some income for, oh, every three years when a set of notes expire. We give three months 
leeway for people to swap those for, for new Bristol pounds. Um, but there's always some overbacking um, because you know, not everyone uh, chooses to do that. And in fact, uh, we know that a lot of the pounds are just bought by people from the Tourist Information Centre uh, and they take them home and stick them on their fridge and show them to their friends and neighbours and say, oh, I, I went to this place called Bristol, it's really cool, they have this thing, you know, look at these. You know, anyway. So, you know, that we know that that's a lot of it. And so then we get a bit of income from that three years down the line, basically. Um, in terms of the digital money, you know, when you're transferring your money into the BCU and calling it Bristol Pounds, it is just pounds sterling sitting in BCU. That's all it is. Um, so yeah, it, that, there's no there's no big pot of money that sits on my balance sheet that I can dip into. Uh, the trust account is outside our balance sheet. But the digital ones, they become part of that asset pool as well. You were saying that was separate. Well, it, it's it's part of. BCU's asset, the, the credit union's asset, right. it's just right. like any other money held on account at the credit union. It's just that we've chosen to restrict access to those accounts so that you can only access them for payments through the Cyclos system. Okay, great. No, thank you. I'm glad we cleared that up. And so I want to go on to understand how that works in the new system. Um, but just before we go there, so was the idea that they expired, the old Bristol pound designed in order to try and generate a bit of extra revenue. Like you said, it doesn't come for three years down the line, but was that expiration some attempted at demurrage or anything? No, no. Um, they did think about demurrage and you know, that kind of script currency, but uh, I think in their early market research, you know, people were not keen and so they, they, didn't, they didn't push that. No, we, the, the simple answer is you're, we're not allowed to print uh, real cash. Only the Bank of England is allowed to print real cash. The only thing that other people are allowed to print are tokens or vouchers. Uh, and vouchers have to have uh, an expiry date. Same, same as book tokens. You, know, you buy an, a book token, it has to have an expiry date on it by law. Um, and um, so that's just how it happens, you know, how it has to happen. If we didn't have to have an expiry date, we would rather not, frankly, because um, it just, uh, it, it, every time they expire, it causes, a, oh, I didn't know it expired. Oh, it's not proper money, is it? You know, it's just, it's just, so I could do without that, frankly, but uh, okay. yeah. And so with CityPay, will, what is the mechanism for getting hold of CityPay pounds? Is it the same? I have to go and buy them. And where is the money stored? And the same questions. So, well, there, we probably won't reprint Bristol Pounds. The, the Bristol Pounds that are currently in circulation, paper ones, until September 2021 will, will just carry on as normal and integrate with the Bristol Pay system instead of the old digital Bristol Pound system. So, I mean, I think the easiest way to think of Bristol Pay or City Pay is a bit like PayPal. You know, if you, you might, load some money into your PayPal account so that you've just got it sitting there and you can pay for things and people might pay you for things and you, it might sit there or you might draw it down. You know, you might take the money out of your PayPal account. And I tend to keep a bit of a balance in my PayPal account uh, just so that, you know, it's always there. The, the, as there's only one problem with PayPal, really, which is that you have to have um, a real bank account. You can't just set up an e-wallet account without also having a bank account. We, on purpose, uh, want to have e-wallets and not have to have a bank account. And the reason is we really want to address digital financial exclusion. Now, I mean, different people are, are in different places about whether cash is a, a good or a bad thing. I mean, you listen to Brett Scott and you think, of course, we must have cash. And then you listen to David Birch and you think, well, you know, cash is mainly uh, enabling people to, you know, evade taxes and, and uh, for the black market to flourish. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be judgmental about whether or not it's a good or a bad thing. I'm just pragmatic. Shops have gone cashless, especially in COVID. You know, that's accelerated it a very great deal. And given that that is reality, well, you know, rather than try and be King Canute and hold the, the tide back, my feeling is, well, let's come up with some solutions to that that are gonna work for people. Now, because this is regulated not as a bank, but as an electronic money institution, um, that gives us 
a whole different um, a whole different approach to what's called know your customer, which is the way through which you know, regulated financial entities have to engage to ensure there's no money laundering. And for I'm sure you've all opened bank accounts. Uh, you know, if you want to open a bank account, you've basically got to uh, you know have things like um, a council tax bill or some other utility bill registered to your address. You've got to have um, either a passport or a driving license. So you know if you're poor. Uh, you probably can't afford to learn to drive and you probably haven't been abroad. You know, if you're a recent immigrant, you may well have no paperwork at all. If Again, if you're living in multiple occupancy or are of no fixed abode, you know, it's very difficult to just have these bits of paper. So uh, instead, what we're saying is, well, with, with e-wallets, in fact, the, the very minimum level, uh, which enables you to just get going and cycle up to, uh, I think it's 150 euros uh, through your account, um, or equivalent um, per month, you literally need nothing. You could say you're Mickey Mouse and, and make up a date of birth and, and that would be okay. I'm not saying that's necessarily what we want to do. I'm just saying that's what the EMI regulations allow. But they also allow what's called a, a proportionate approach to know your customer. And so for example, we might say, hey, look, uh, for recent refugees and homeless people, it's enough to be registered with a homeless charity or a refugee charity or to be registered with the GP, you know, you know to, to have an NHS record in effect. Uh, and then that's enough, that, you know, we, we know you're a person. Um, and, and that can be verified without a piece of paper. Um, so these are the sorts of things we're, we're looking at. Uh, and we're, we're in the process of fine tuning that. Pagey, who are the providers of the new e-wallet platform, uh, they're working with uh, an, an EMI provider called Clear Junction. And uh, you know, and making sure that they're happy with with all of those know your customer uh, you know, proposals that we're making. Um, so yeah, so um, and in terms of how you load money into it, so I'm saying you don't have to have a bank account, but it does interact with ba the bank system. So you can give someone, like let's say you're a recent immigrant, you've managed to get a job, which is great, and and not a cash in hand black market job, which is fabulous. Um, uh, but I need to be able to have my wages paid into an account where you can give them some things that look like bank account details and it'll have a reference number in there as part of it. So it goes to the Clear Bank um, or Clear Junctions bank account, which is, I think is held in Clear Bank. And then you know, because of the reference number, it gets routed through to your e-wallet account. So you can still receive money in from the real banking system, if you like. Uh, but it, it means that even if you don't have an account in your own name, you're able to control your own money. And for me, this is really important. You know, I think one of the key drivers of this kind of modern day slavery stuff is that, that so many people cannot control their own money, their own digital money. And so they have to have actors who may be bad actors you know, acting on their behalf. Brilliant. No, I think the financial inclusion stuff that you've mentioned there is super important and it sounds brilliant that you've got a plan for that. Definitely the, the EMI direction seems to cover a lot of those bases. So can we go through a, a little example of how it would work then? If I, so I've got, if I've signed up to CityPay, Bristol Pay, and I've now got my electronic wallet on my phone and I want to go and do a payment in a local shop in Bristol, how does that work? Can I do a blended trade? So I trade partly in normal pounds or Bristol pounds, or how does that work? So the payment infrastructure will be, at least initially, completely separate. So there'll be separate little point of sale terminals that are NFC and QR code readers so that it can interface either with a QR code on a phone or with a, with a you know, like a, a card, basically. Um, the cards are probably not in the first phase. They're probably, I don't know, nine months from now but yeah anyway. um you'll you'll have had to put some money in that account first so transfer some money from your bank account into it or you know get your benefits or wages being paid into your e-wallet account you know in in the longer term that's what i'd like to see that, that everyone's using the e-wallet to pay their rent pay their bills and they're using it going around the city because the more they use it the more likely they are to engage with the token schemes and the more likely they are to, you know, the more they're helping us to raise money for local good causes. 
So, so can I have regular pounds inside my e-wallet or do they immediately become... Yeah, the, yeah the, the, the main thing is regular pounds. The main platform is it's, it's up there with Google and Apple. It's just a payment platform like PayPal. You know, it's just a payment platform uh, with real sterling. But the reason we need that is because that's how we're going to pay the bills and make some money and have the platform to do for what for me is the exciting bit, which is the token bit. That's where we get to really be impactful. But we can't just do the impactful stuff without having something or other to, to pay the bills. And also, you know, the reality is um, we're all using electronic money every day just to get around. And so the, if you're interacting with that electronic money through um, the Bristol Pay app, you're hopefully then getting some messaging around, oh, look at this token scheme. You could be cycling, you could be doing this, you could be um, you know, helping garden in your local park and, uh, and doing a, a, a great idea today, thanks to, well, I didn't have it, Gary had a great idea today, that we could be you know, encouraging people to do um, the kind of XR style um, uh, D, uh, de-escalation training you know and and you know so we can really see this as if we can help keep people fit active purposeful uh, engaged in in the community um you know coming out of covid the demand on statutory services is going to be huge just at a time when uh the the actual um, money that uh, you know that local authorities and municipalities have to meet those needs is going to be extremely low uh, so, you know, anything we can do to reduce the uh, burden uh, and the need for statutory services is going to be a great thing. Okay. So when I go into the merchant, though, and I want to pay, and I want to pay in Bristol pounds rather than my fiat pounds from my electric wallet, how does that work? Do I need to convert my fiat pounds into Bristol pounds before paying the merchant? So you'll be choosing, when I go into the merchant, Am I paying with Google Pay, Apple Pay, or my normal bank card? In which case, I'm using one point of sale thing. Or have I got? Have I decided I'm I'm a Bristol Pay user because I want to choose a more ethical payment method? In which case, I put some money into my Bristol Pay e wallet, and I'm going to use that app with a completely different uh, terminal. And the reason it needs to be a different terminal is so that it's not going down the Visa Mastercard rails. It is possible in the future, and and maybe to to make it you know to make it easier especially for big businesses to get involved that we have to look at integrations with existing point of sale infrastructure the problem is they tend to cost you know upwards of fifty thousand pounds to do and you're then likely to be back in the situation where you're having to give a little bit of the money to the you know to that point of sale infrastructure provider so we're trying to keep it a completely separate rails Okay, excellent. No, I fully got it now. Thanks for taking the time to clarify that for me. I hope it's clear to everybody else. Um, and so now I'm thinking, I do want to come on and talk about the tokens, because like you say, that is the exciting part. And it's making me think of the whole coin, actually, and the token system that they use there, which is very similar. Yeah. But just while we're on that cost of transactions and getting away from Visa, presumably the model that you've just mentioned means that you're going to have to supply every merchant with a new terminal and there will be costs associated with that and that you need to cover from your transaction costs. Have you done any analysis of your transaction costs and how uh, competitive yeah. you think you'll be? Yeah, I mean, we're going to make sure that we at least match iZettle at first, but with a different USP, which is saying, look, it, you know, maybe it's the same cost as iZettle, but some of your money is going to good causes. And we're probably going to have a totalizer on the website showing you know, how much money is being raised for good causes. Um, but I don't think we can I don't think we can go around trying to undercut everybody. You know, that will just make it very difficult to be different. Uh, because we're unlikely ever to be able to be the cheapest, I suspect. Um, so uh, um, I can't remember what the rest of the question was now. Um, About the costs of the terminals for the merchant. Oh, yes, terminals, yeah. yes. So, yeah, we have done some modelling. I mean, mainly, to be fair, uh, Pagey, our partner, has done a lot of the modelling on this because they're the ones that are going to be, you know, determining a lot of the costs, in effect, because, you know, they've got the the EMI stuff to do. So they're kind of having to work out what the cost is. Um, and um, 
yeah, I think we, we have pretty much decided that trying to ask businesses to pay for these terminals, especially in the early days when it, it's not like they're getting anything from it, it's just the cost uh, to pay for an extra bit of kit that they didn't want in the first place, just taking up space on their till and they've got to try and, you know, work out how it integrates with their till and train all their staff on how to take payments in, you know, Bristol Pay. Uh, it's, you know, we know from having done this with Bristol Pound, uh, that's not an easy, it's not an easy sell. So yeah, that, that will be a bit of kit. I think uh, they cost in real terms about 30 quid, um, 25, 30 quid. And we will just have to absorb that basically. Um, I mean, we are very lucky in that we have found a partner in Pagey who really believe in this vision and would like to enable it to happen. Um, they're keen to see their payment platform be used for good and be used to help local economies. And they see that you know, increasingly power is being devolved to cities and cities are trying to manage their own economies. So you know, they feel the time is right for them to get into this. And they're prepared to plough money into us right now to help get this off the ground and make it prove itself. And in, you know, in a few years time, we'll be gradually paying them back, uh, assuming all this works. Um, but but uh, right now, I'm in the very lucky position of not having to think, oh my God, what kind of bank home draft do we need <laughs> to, to see us through this, this initial phase? And I think Pagey are assuming that to the point of break even, you know, they're going to need upwards of a million pounds of investment and that break even probably doesn't happen until year four or year five. So, you know, it's, it's a fairly long term um, uh, approach uh, and we're just so lucky um, because, you know, without this, basically this experiment would not be able to happen. We would just have, uh, well, I would have hung up the office keys uh, back in um, about March when the money was going to run out. Um, and then we'd just be winding down the paper pounds um, and you know, the, the Bristol pound would already have gone in terms of the electronic um, version. So, you know, we, we've been very lucky and it, it was a difficult, you know, if I'm honest, it, it was a slightly difficult uh, decision to take in that um, I had started developing a lot of this thinking last year and I'd been thinking, ah, oh, you know, we're going to build this from scratch, we're going to get some investors for good in this, and we'll build our own thing, and it can be open source, and it can be this, it can be, it can be lovely, it can be perfect. We'll, we'll build the perfect, most ethical, most whatever. Um, but that was never going to happen. Uh, we would just have gone bust. And instead, okay, we're having to partner with what is basically a commercial firm to build that infrastructure for us and keep us afloat during that phase. And yes, they will probably make some profits out of this, although they are looking at becoming a B Corp, um, you know, so that they, they are prepared to put purpose further ahead than, than shareholder return. And, and it's on that basis that they're trying to get investments themselves at the moment. But, it, you know, it was, yeah, I, I wanted to be able to go, we are blameless and perfect. And, and I, you know, I, I have to say, well, no, we, we are working with, you know, commercial people, but at the same time, you know, as I say, I, I, I think it's more important that we do some experiments and that we are pragmatic, um, because if we all try and do everything perfectly, uh, you know, nothing will ever happen. You know, I, I think on the whole, progress in our sector being kind of, you know, environmental innovation, let's say, on the whole, because we're all trying to be so perfect, progress is too slow and we, we have to be a little bit real and say well guess what we're all in the market economy so that's that's the basis on which i have to start and then hopefully i can iterate my, can I can see michael's got his hand up yeah th uh, thank you um lovely stuff very interesting um descriptions explanation love it wonderful um question i've got immediately is when does the qr code um, device become available to uh, your merchants? Yeah, um, we're, so we're hoping that the, um, it's going to be a staggered rollout, you know, um, we're hoping that in time for the end of the uh, digital Bristol pound, we will at least be able to, uh, to let people set up their own new accounts and that there will be the online portal just for um, um, you know, the equivalent to faster payments, if you like, on your bank. 
Um, the app will probably follow in September and the app will be uh, you know, simultaneous with the QR code reader because otherwise, uh, you know, there's no point in having an app if you can't, if you can't go and pay in businesses. So we're hoping September, maybe October for, for that sort of um, main thing to, be, to become available. Thank you. And then um, the tokens bit. So the tokens have to kick in from the word go, right? Well, they, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they'll be there on the very first version of the app. Um, at the moment, um, I would say we're still bottoming out. Do we definitely want to do these as blockchain tokens or not? It would be much easier from Pagey's perspective to just hold them as units of account or whatever, uh, even though they're not backed by anything in their own system. Um, but um, I think there is a feeling that we should do these as a separate blockchain thing so that should the relationship with Pagey fall apart or Pagey go bust or whatever else, um, you know, that the, the, the paper, that, sorry, the sterling money is obviously uh, protected through the EMI regulation and it's all in clear bank and all the rest of it but um, we would want those tokens to be protected as well. And so it would be better if they are real blockchain tokens that we could then uh, access through a different platform uh, if, we, if we needed to. Okay, I, I imagine that side of it is, is highly complex and we could go down the blockchain rabbit hole for a while. But yeah. I'm more interested yeah. in that. how will you determine how many tokens one can earn for a certain type of activity. Hmm. So I think that there are two things to say here. Uh, the first is um, I don't know and it's not for me to decide. So the aim, especially around the, 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 the tokens that are aiming to change behaviours, if you like, to help us meet um, you know, our zero carbon goals and, and all the rest of it, those I really strongly believe need to be co-designed with communities and so the, the approach is going to be we uh, get some money we work with uh, University of the West of England to pilot some specific schemes in certain neighborhoods uh, to do that work you know to, to uh, understand what people care about what people are prepared to do what would speak to them what would encourage them uh, and then design some tokens and then test them out for six months and uh, evaluate them and then if they work, fine, we try and roll them out in, in another area. So, um, so I guess that's, that's the first thing. Uh, and in terms of you know, the values and um, what they're worth, that kind of depends on whether or not they are seen as exchangeable or, or not. And I, I would add in here that there is some, again, another, another kind of softly, softly approach or bit of research that's needed here. <clears throat> and that is around the fiscal treatment of these tokens. Because, yeah, I guess I was assuming initially, oh, well, we'll get the tokens and the tokens will mean, oh, I get free entry at the cinema because the cinema want to say, look how woke we are as a cinema. We want to congratulate um, community members for doing all this good stuff. So we're going to give away a few free cinema tickets to people who are you know, earning lots of tokens. Um, and that's fine as long as those tokens don't then go anywhere else. But if we then want to encourage businesses to, to behave in that way, we might think, well, those businesses should then be able to trade those tokens on in some way. And as soon as you do that, those tokens have a fiscal value. You know, they're, they, they're deemed to have a sterling equivalence. Um, and um, uh, especially if it's, for example, um, associated with business rates, the tax man looks at that. He's got plenty of tools in his toolbox to say, I can see that these tokens because they're, you know, they're, they're driving a certain discount on business rates, which are a set value, then there is an equivalence, whether I want there to be or not. The tax man will say there is an equivalence between this token and a, a value, and therefore suddenly uh, businesses are in danger of, of having to pay VAT on sales they didn't really make. Uh, individuals might have their benefits and their, their personal taxation affected. So we're, what we're trying to do at the moment is uh, I found a, a friendly tax QC um, who is helping us to work through hopefully some, some ways around this. Um, but I think it's tricky 
Um, and if we look at the history of local currencies or, or you know, non-central non, you know, non bank currencies, the main thing usually that makes them fall down is when someone says, ah, this is a tax loophole. You know, we, don't, we aren't controlling the money enough. We aren't controlling the tax. Um, and, and so I think we need to you know, be aware of that and be careful how we design these interactions to make sure that there are no unintended consequences. Now, I don't want any of this to, to, it's not because I don't like tax. I think tax is on the whole a good thing, although we could argue about whether, you know, VAT and income tax are appropriate and whether there shouldn't be some very different taxes around carbon and wealth. But anyway, uh, that's beside the point. Uh, on the whole, I kind of agree that there need to be some state delivered services and they should be paid for through taxation. But um, if we're trying to get people to do something over and above and different to outside the market economy, then for me, those activities should fall outside the taxation system. But you know, it's going to be difficult to make sure that we definitely avoid any collision with the taxation system. I can see Michael going, no, 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 it's nice and easy. You don't have to have anything, uh, any tax impact uh, at all. I'd love to hear how, how you get around this, Michael. Well, on the contrary, we don't get around it. We embrace it. My very first meeting with my provincial minister of finance in 1982, I assured him that everything we were doing was tax code applicable. Whatever moves is taxable. That's well established in every jurisdiction I've reached anywhere in the world. I think it's a, it's a problematic process to start off putting yourself outside that deliberately rather than accommodating it appropriately. Um, so I, I, I think it's interesting how you've defined yourself very powerfully in terms of the conventional currency, the conventional banking, the conventional regulations, the uh, digital currency requirements, financial services, etc. And so you're bound to that structure, uh, call it that ship, you've nailed yourself to that ship, lashed yourself to that mast. I would really recommend that you take on the taxation uh, process right at the, at the core. Render unto Caesar. We live in a society that depends upon the tax process. I think it's a very, um, very important decision to say, say which side of that line you sit on. Um, I've got much more to say, of course, but um, maybe I can say a few words right at the very end when we've got further. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, if I've understood you rightly, Michael, I think you're saying that you would suggest that the tokens do become fungible, that you do ascribe some value to them so that they are taxable. Is that correct? Um, whatever you're doing, it is taxable. But not if they're whatever just, you're doing. If, not ever if they're just discounts and they stop, like Diana was saying. So they're basically the cinema just says, okay, we're nice. We'll let a couple of people in effectively for free because we're going to accept these tokens, then that's if, not fair. Yes, if, no if, you have said, if you have said right from the beginning, my token is worthless, then you're probably quite right. And discounting is a worthless procedure. Now, that's my problem with the whole float the tokens from nothing context. Um, I mean, to short to the, the, my main point would be that I think you've got the cart before the horse here, that you're trying to push water uphill, that you're creating um, a unit that's meant to replicate the value of the, what you call the great British pound. I'd rather call no, it no, the no, Uck no. pound. No, well, no, no I, know, I know in terms of the token later, yeah. So you're trying to create transactions and trading and you're very much basing yourself in one reference point, conventional money banking regulation. Now you want to float a token. You want people to use this token, but you're starting off by saying that it's worthless, except that it runs a discount for businesses somewhere. Now, I, I understand the effectiveness of this process. I really do. I understand how this marketing works. It just doesn't leave you with a currency of any value, with any promissory note behind it at all. Mm -hmm. So it's... But nonetheless, your platform can be used perfectly. This is my question about the QR codes. If the QR code readers are being deployed to your process, 
that's delicious from the perspective of, uh, for instance, open money development. You create a perfect uh, space for us to test out our QR systems, which actually work in a completely different way, but entirely compatible. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm delighted to hear your progress and think most of your analysis is very, very good. Um, but I think it is maybe time to shift your um, understanding of tokens versus relationship. Yeah. Um, but that's it, enough to say now. I, I, if we and I carried on this conversation, let's do it straight up rather than in this context. Yeah. But it's up to you. I, I think you're right. And, and so it may well be that my idea of, hey, maybe we can have you know, those tokens also operate in businesses and drive discounts. You know, maybe that's just not possible. And um, we have to say, you know, the tokens burn at the point that a business accepts them. And that, that's yeah. fine. To me, this is more no, about encouraging behavior change. It's, uh, yes. you know, it's, it's not about a trade. It's just how do we encourage behavior change and would a discount help? But maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it's better to just do these kind of store of value type, uh, type tokens no. rather than no. fungible, uh, tradable ones. No, um, the, the shift is a, is a totally different zone. You're still juggling the same, the same deck chairs. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. On the contrary, I'm saying I really want the tokens to be completely outside um, the financial system, if at all possible. And that may therefore mean that there has to be an absolute brick wall between people and businesses. And uh, and you know, and, and because I think it's I think it's important. Anyway, whatever. We'll, we'll as you say, let's have another conversation about this later. Uh, I would look forward to that. I think it could be very important for the effectiveness of your rollout and its uh, propagation. Mm -hmm. I recently had a similar conversation with um, a representative of Sardex mm -hmm. with the same issue about how you join and separate between one currency and another. And the strategies you adopt at that point are absolutely critical to whether this flies or dies, in my view, humble as it may seem to be. Thank you. I will now. Thanks, Michael. Let's, Thank let's go to Mary. Mary has a question, and if anybody else does, then uh, yeah, feel free to chip in after Mary. Are you still there, Mary? Yeah. Can't hear you. You're still muted, Mary. There you go. Yeah. Um... Uh, several questions, I think. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Michael's point of view. Um, in the let's world, we're, we're, sort of, we're really um, dealing with um, people who haven't got uh, much income. So if the taxman was looking at them, it would probably be below the taxable rate anyway. So, you know, it's not such a big issue. Um, but... Uh, I'm a bit puzzled as to who is issuing these tokens. It sounds a bit Chinese. You know, the, the Chinese, uh, uh, what do they call it? The social credit system, where you get a point for being a good girl. Um, what, what's going on here? Um, and uh, uh, if, if you want a mutual credit, that's one question. If you want a mutual credit system, why don't, have you, have you been in touch with Bristol Let's? There's a perfectly good mutual credit uh, scheme operating in Bristol for decades. Uh, um, I have made, tried to make contact with the Let's scheme. It's not operating. Uh, and they put me through to Can Do, who are setting up a time banking scheme. Um, I would say that I, I'm not quite seeking to do Let's necessarily, uh, although it could certainly be a platform that would enable Let's operations to happen. Uh, and I'm not really trying to do time banking. At the moment, I'm feeling that uh, in terms of that sharing economy, gift economy thing, we, we almost let it develop from the ground up rather than saying we're running a let scheme. We just say to people, here are some tokens. Why don't you, uh, you know, we can say, we'll, we'll give everyone 10 tokens when they- Yeah, well, who is we? Who's giving them the tokens? Well, we can do that when they open up the, um, you know, when they open an account. But I, and I think one thing to say is there'll be different sorts of token schemes. So there might be some which are the kind of Bristol thanks where you're paying favours forward and it's encouraging the gift and sharing economy in a very loose way. 
uh, not requiring a lot of um, time banking and let's type infrastructure. Um, but the other, the other thing then around the behavior change, you're right, there is a real concern that if we were to just let um, the, the council decide who's going to be a good girl, who's going to be a naughty girl or whatever. Uh, I, I share your concern around that. But what we do need uh, is to find ways of engaging people with uh, changing their behavior. If we're going to meet um, you know, zero carbon targets, if we're going to uh, you know, try and develop uh, some pro-social behaviors that are gonna help to um, improve health and well-being outcomes and reduce uh, demands on statutory services. Yeah. So yes, I, I think I think the whole idea, or one of the one of the ideas uh, for um, mutual credit schemes and the sort that uh, people to people, is that um, it was about the circular economy, um, uh, local growing, um, mending things, fixing things, um, and uh, what you didn't want you could give to somebody else. It was all always about, um, you know, uh, uh, l low um, uh, low carbon type of behaviour. Before people talked about that, yeah. um, I absolutely agree, and and I thoroughly embrace that. And I guess what I'm hoping is that we can add to that and make it cheaper and easier for people to run those kinds of let's and time banking schemes if they want to create those tokens on our on our system. Uh, then we can take away some of the governance and bookkeeping headaches that they would otherwise be having to uh, fulfill through, you know, through volunteer um, doing, doing bookkeeping and stuff. So we can provide an infrastructure that will well, help that. And we're not trying to say we're going to run all the lets and time banking I, because we don't have, you know, there's only two people in the Bristol Town team. Yeah, no but way but, run all these things. but, but there are platforms for running lets. Yes, indeed. But at the moment, none are, none are operating in Bristol. Uh, so I'd love, you know, for example, the Let's people said, we just don't have the capacity to run Let's at the moment. So I'm okay. saying to them, well, look, we've got a, a platform that maybe could help make that easier for you um, because all of, the, you know, all of the transactions can happen and anyone who's on the Bristol Pay platform could then join that token scheme or that let scheme or that um, so are you talking about the site class? No, I'm talking about our new platform that will have these you know, tokens as well as pound sterling. But you haven't developed it yet. Well, it, it's in development. So I, I'm hoping that the tokens will be live, let's say October, November time, probably. Yeah. So when did you talk to the Bristol Let's? Can I quote you to them when I contact uh, them? You will need to bear with me one moment while I check my uh, emails. Um, oh no, in fact, I know where it is. It's on a. While Diana's doing that, I wonder if anybody else has other questions. It's interesting to do the comparison with Let's and Mutual Credit. Um, but wondering if anyone else has any thoughts about the tokens, because the token economics side of this is quite new and. Um, the interview that I did with Lisa and David Bovell from uh, Holcoin a couple of years back, you know, did it does strike me as very similar to this in that what they're doing is, yeah, people can earn tokens in a very similar way by doing good things in their community. And then basically those tokens are redeemable in certain shops for a discount against yeah. purchases. I, so they've had a, a reasonable heard, amount of success. I heard that Holcoin had folded. It may have That's done now. They, they've been looking at a new project, um, so I'm not quite sure of the success of the actual the tokens and uh, the actual whole coins themselves. But when, when it was operating, there certainly were people, especially um, those, yeah, of limited incomes who were getting significant benefits from the token system. Okay. Um, I'm still um, plowing through emails. Um, Mary, um, can you pop your um, email address in the um, Zoom chat and then I will um, um, get back to you with the name of the person I spoke to or email. Okay. So I've got a question. Um, what's the, 
what's going to drive people to use this system rather than whatever they've got already? Um, so I, I hope the answer is uh, it's the ethical way to pay. Instead of money leaving the Bristol economy and going to Google and Apple, let's keep it in Bristol and let's make sure that services are reinvested in the city. Uh, I think that's probably the main thing, and especially if the council really come out on board and say to the big um, big um, businesses, you know, shops, Tesco and everybody, uh, please uh, encourage Bristol Pay because it's showing your social value, it's showing you giving something back to Bristol. So I think that's probably um, the easy message. I think the other reason that uh, in due course, um, the council, Bristol Water, Bristol Sports, you know, various other uh, city institutions, if you like, are going to say, please use Bristol Pay, is going to be because they want people to integrate with the token scheme. So for example, I know Bristol Water wants people to cut their uh, water use. And so I've already started talking to them. They're very keen to have a token to encourage people to minimize their water use. Um, good energy, um, uh, are very keen to have a token scheme that might uh, enable people or encourage people to uh, coincide peak demand with peak production of renewable resources. Um, Bristol Waste is obviously keen to reduce waste um, and um, Bristol Sport is keen to encourage people in low-income neighbourhoods to engage in their uh, extracurricular sports activities because that's part of what they're funded to do but they find it very difficult to incentivize kids uh, who might rather be playing on their computer games or whatever. Yeah so all so, these people want to are interested in supporting the token yep. element of the system. Yep. Um, and so, so why don't you just go with the token element of the system and not worry about the other bit? Because then I wouldn't be able to make it pay, just like Hull Coin haven't. So the other bit is you know, that that's sort of like the tail wagging the dog, in a sense, isn't it? So yes. what you're saying, I, is I am completely upfront about that. Yeah, yeah. Only, so, I the, want the, to do the token stuff. Yeah. The only way I can do it is by having a platform that pays for itself and that pays for yeah. the infrastructure to enable it. Okay, that's, that's clear. Yeah, it just feels a bit like you're sort of competing with yourself, in a sense. Um, I don't know, I, I don't see it that way at all. <laughs> no. I, I see it as uh, I have a hidden agenda and an overt agenda, uh, if you like. And so the easy way to, for people to get involved is with the overt thing of this is an ethical payment platform. But then hopefully they will be excited by the tokens. And I think that that's really the main reason for those big city institutions to get on board because they are trying to, you know, get people into engage in sport or get people to uh, engage in the arts, build community relationships and uh, get people involved. Um, and those are the kinds of things which are going to uh, start to fix some of the societal and environmental problems. So, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the hidden agenda. And, and plus that thing of, you know, let's not, yes, we're in a market economy and that's what's going to pay for the platform. But I want to use the platform to develop the other bits of the economy, which yeah. are going to uh, reduce the pressure on the market economy and on the state economy. Right. So the so the you think that the that's going to be enough to drive the numbers onto the platform? Because that was one of your points of criticism of the Bristol Pound, wasn't it? That it was all about um, encouraging ethical behaviour, and so it was operating well, in a bubble. Okay, so th there are two problems. One was the way we, uh, we marketed the Bristol Pound, uh, and two was the structural thing. You know, the Bristol Pound was only for little, uh, little tiny businesses, and therefore uh, it was never going to be able to operate at scale. Uh, this doesn't have that structural um, break, if you like. You know, yeah, Tesco's can use this, great, the more the merrier, and Tesco's will then be actually doing something to repay some of the social value to Bristol uh, and say thank you in the form of you, you know, encouraging the use of mm. this payment platform. So, so, so a big retailer like Tesco, how much would it cost them to implement support for this sort of system? Well, it, it, will, it will cost them. Um, we're at the moment, I think Sainsbury's is likely to be the first one to take it up. They're very keen to, to, even though it will cost them money, to do that social value thing. 
I'm not going to approach Waitrose first because I think they would say we're already doing it. We've already got our green tokens and our whatever and people are voting but where, where are, you know. So I, I doubt that they're the, the best one to engage but Sainsbury's have already said they're keen and they would like to be, you know, have a special period where for six months maybe, I don't know how long they're saying, uh, they would like to be the only big um, big supermarket on the platform to, you know, to show just how you know, ahead of it and you know, to, to try and gain that kind of market, sure. um, okay. whatever, from being part of this good thing. So really, I mean, I think this comes back to what you were saying earlier, Dino, like your, your overt agenda is behavior change, really. Like that's the, the main mission here is behavior change across the board, right? And what you're doing is you're trying to use this financial innovation to drive that behavior change. Yeah. And, I, you know, let, let's face it, I think local currencies have always been about behavior change. You know, as, as Mary was saying, we, you know, the let's has always been about trying to encourage a non-market economy, a sharing economy, a green economy, a, a local economy. You know, a, a lot of that stuff has been, um, uh, Michael. But please let, let me state, let's has always been about the general economy and creating circularity at every level, including national governments as participants in the process, certainly municipal governments, and certainly any business that wanted to have circularity as an aspect of its business model. That was there in the mid 80s. So please not let to reduce it to haircuts and babysitting. That really irritates me. I, I know it's a mistaken perception, just had to flag it. We're in for the big game. The big game is something like 30 to 40% of the economy. Unless we're aiming that big, we shouldn't be paying any attention. Mm -hmm. Let's get this up to scale, please. I'm delighted with your project. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to be right there yeah, so that uh -huh. we can get on with, I, I'm with back engineering it. Yeah, I'm sympathetic with Michael here if you have the aspiration to do it. And now that we've heard that local authorities are so starved of, this is what's been going on with the austerity, starving local authorities of, of, of money so that they can't do the care system properly. Um, they've got people uh, sleeping on the streets. Um, and, uh, and now with this COVID crisis, some of them are, have said that they're suing for bankruptcy. Why aren't they using community currencies for some of their stuff? Because there's no good platforms, because the perception is lacking, yeah. because there is no significant strategy. Yeah. But the strategy is available. If you have Sainsbury's interested, then um, that is a wide open door for uh, serious leverage in circularity, very serious leverage. But I would suggest that it comes not from pushing the water up the hill, but by letting it flow in the better direction. You've... Um, your, your method of initiating is what I would call conventional and doomed to be stuck at that level unless you shift it into a functional promise by the businesses to provide, i.e. make them responsible for the money that they are issuing. Now, if you do that, you've got a, a red hot pepper here. This is going to fly like, um, like nothing I've ever seen before. So I'm, I'm delighted and I'm hoping for some flexibility in here mm -hmm. I mean, with APIs for instance. Yeah I would say the businesses are not issuing money um, yeah I, I, I would disagree. I got you and that is the distinction that really we have to cross over. I guess there's an argument here like with all of these alternative financial systems you know mutual credit schemes let send alternative currencies local currencies like the success can only be measured by the adoption right it's all about growing the community growing the market starting yeah. small but getting something viable that can be scaled up and that actually yep. succeeds because once you've done that you have the opportunity to introduce, introduce new financial uh, instruments or designs or mechanisms tokens whatever they may be if you've already got a viable community that is exchanging value with each other then those possibilities are much simpler like as we've learned you know, very hard lessons at the Open Credit Network. You know, even if you have good software and a good system, 
it's still very hard to convince businesses to sign up. So the work that Diana is doing there in terms of talking to Sainsbury's and everybody else, I think is absolutely critical. And Bristol Pound has such a strong uh, community really, you know, and has grown so well and been so well used that I'd love to see that uh, community evolve into using this new version of city pay so that then maybe we can transition to further financial innovations uh, further down the line. So I think it's a definite step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We're sort One. of approaching our, our hour and a half here. I don't know if anyone else has any sort of uh, summary or ever, any other questions for Diana before maybe we wrap, wrap up. I see Martin uh, and Gary and Anthony here who all probably have uh, lots of thoughts on this and haven't said anything if you if you'd like any comments. Well, it's just um, opening all sorts of interesting issues for me um, to clarify my own thinking about. Uh, I'm, 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 it's been very, very uh, thought provoking. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to have, been, to have spent this hour and a half with you. That's all. And, and you know, I have the greatest respect for Diana and her thinking and what she's been doing. So, that's nice. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. I guess what I'm wondering is, yeah, as well as the tokens, which clearly your tokens are a key part of this, the new project from the design, like how many other uh, ideas you entertained before um, thinking of going with the token system? And if there are any plans sort of further past the token system, I know that that maybe is a little bit far reaching thinking right now because the token system needs to get out and rolling and clearly that's your core objective. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I already feel like I, my thoughts are about six months to a year ahead of where we really are. Um, so I, I don't know what comes next, but I, I do think, um, you know, playing with this, separating out the functions of money to do different things than the market economy. You know, that for me is is what the exciting stuff is to develop some 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 other things that enable exchange, enable people to develop and grow, enable us to uh, meet the challenges in our society and and you know our planet, um, but uh, in other ways than the restrictive things that money have enabled us to do so far. That sounds great. I completely agree. I mean, even just presenting and helping people understand those three different aspects of money, I think is a kind of fundamental part of changing our relationships with money. Because the more people that understand that, the easier it is for us to move past the kind of current regime towards something which may be a little bit more sustainable. Um, I guess lastly, I would probably ask um, what you need and what you're hoping for next as part of Bristol Pound, Bristol Pay, City Pay. How can people get involved? Is there anything that they can do? Are there any particular types of support that you need or things that you're looking for in order to help the, with the mission? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, what I need is people who have got ideas for, for those tokens, how we could create those, how we could test them out, how we could take people with us in a co-design process. Um, I guess mainly that is going to be Bristol people for now in that this is where we're trying to do it first. But I think the other thing that would be useful is if people think, wow, I think our local authority or our, you know, would be interested in this stuff. Yeah, I'm really happy to talk to, to other people as well. Uh, you know, if it, if it ends up that actually extra pay gets the tokens thing off the ground quicker than Bristol pay, you know, that's fine with me. Um, so yeah, I, I'm certainly willing to work with people outside if, if they're thinking this is a solution, um, you know, elsewhere in the country. The other, the other cities that you mentioned there in the little list, Exeter and Bath, and have, have you had some engagement? Okay, finger in the air. But I, I certainly know that um, we had a really interesting session with Iris from the Everyone Every Day project in Barking and Dagenham, where they've partnered with the council and they've done an incredible project, which is in, all about 
uh, citizen involvement and um, the founding of new co-ops and new institutions throughout Barking and Dagman to try and alleviate some of the stresses there. And they're working very closely in partnership with the council. So I would imagine that they would be a very ripe opportunity for becoming one of your yeah, possible partners. Well, I'd love any introductions. Um, other ones that I know are kind of keen are Exeter and York. Um, so you know, th there are some ongoing conversations there. So I suspect that they're likely likely ones. Brilliant. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there. So thank you very much, Diana, for presenting. It's really encouraging to hear, and we look forward to yeah the next instalment. Hopefully, when things are up and running, we'll have you back, and we can we can check in on some progress. But thank you very much. No problem. Thank you all for coming along. Bye. Yeah.